Patris, et Fidi, Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et ora mortis nostre. Amen. In nomine Patris, et Fidi, Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Brethren in Christ, laudetu Jesus Christus. In secula. This is Timothy Flanders with The Meaning of Catholic. We are joined again by Luis Medina. How you doing, Luis? Good, brother. How you doing? Thanks for having me over again. And as usual, it's a pleasure to be here. Yes, indeed. I'm, we're doing well over here. This is uh, Catholic Empire Part 3. And there's also an intro episode. This is actually the fourth show yeah. altogether. So we're really happy that Luis can be with us and share all of his knowledge about the true story of Catholic Spain. Today's episode, 1600 to 1700, this mm -hmm. century, the 17th century, a decisive century in the history of post-Tridentine Catholicism in general and Spain in particular. Yeah. Post-1492 Spain is very much the story of, in the case of the church, three great papal betrayals. And we're going to see the first one in this century. These particular papal betrayals are a decisive moment where the Pope sides against the faith in a decisive manner, which has a decisive, huge ramifications in the history of Spain. And we're going to see this in this century. And so stay tuned. And it's very relevant to what we're dealing with today. Because really, the story of Spain up to 1492, we were, Luis and I were just talking about this. And I, Luis, I'd like you to comment on this and what we're dealing with today, starting with, with uh, the president-elect Biden imminently uh, be taking power. But uh, we've, we've, we mentioned in the history of Spain, it's really the history of perseverance for the sake of the faith. Yeah. We, we talked about the really the the uh, one of the Spanish kings originally betrayed Spain to the Mo to the Mohammedans to bring the Mohammedans even into Spain in the first place, and then they spent uh, how many years was that? That's uh, you know eight five six hundred seven hundred years fighting back to take back Spain for the faith, and then went on to evangelize the whole world. Mm -hmm. So. And now we're gonna we're gonna be facing the adversity that the Spanish Empire is not gonna face. So, tell a comment, uh, Luis. Can you give us some comments on what we're facing now? What's your perspective? Uh, you're a Texan. You're a, a born. You're you were born in Mexico, right? You're, yeah. You're Monterey, Mexico. Yeah. Excellent. So, so you're looking at uh, the situation that we're in. Are you gonna go back to Mexico at this point? What, where are you? How, what's your perspective on what we're dealing with now? Um, well, um, I'm very blessed to be living in Texas because uh, we're kind of isolated. I know uh, uh, President Trump, current President Trump, so far, <laughs> uh, it will be in the Alamo of all places this afternoon giving a speech. Uh, but uh, from what I perceive in all that, clearly, um, not to get in this controversy, but we've seen this movie before in any Hispanic country. I mean, it's like the whole package. The only difference that I see now in America, you get six hundred dollars in Mexico, you get a you know um, groceries you know given to you. That's about it. <laughs> you know, other than that, it's the same theatrics and shenanigans. Sadly, it breaks my heart honestly to see what, what goes on and uh, and see the media colluding with this. Um, that that part actually was a little bit shocking to me. See that coordination between the three powers of our government and uh, coordinated with the media. But anyway. Do you no. see a big parallel with what's going on now with what's happened already in multiple Hispanic countries, like in South America and all the oh, yeah. takeovers? Oh, yeah. And particularly is uh, you ostracize a big chunk of the population. Like in the case of Mexico, historically, Mexico has been a very traditional population, very conservative. And the people who are in power have been usually like Freemasons and liberals and then supposedly enlightened liberals. Uh and obviously, those are the guys who are in charge. That's actually not to dwell into this. A lot of the uh, the British system uh, uh, style, when it, you know, when you're trying to balance power, they put a minority in power to control the majority. That way, you know, they keep each other in check, and you don't have to deal directly with them. 
Well, Mexico's materialized um, with having uh, liberal uh, Masons in power, uh, pretty much what 90% of uh, former presidents down there have been uh, Masons and have been at odds with the church usually. And then you have the rest of the populace. America, I hope I'm wrong, uh, but it looks like based on my, my experience, uh, we're about to enter a era where the population, the chunk of the population, you know, the, the engine of the nation, you know, which is middle of America uh, and the working class, we're basically going to have to put up with uh, higher elites that are pretty much out of touch with reality. That's which is evident at this point. You know, they have no clue. Uh, and it's both parties. And uh, we're going to have to carry that cross. And I guarantee you, that's not a fun walk, um, putting up with this socialites and elites and, you know, people in power that have no clue what life is like. So, um, you know, uh, part of me also, I don't want to be too fatalistic uh, and too, um, I mean, after all, I'm not a Calvinist. And uh, uh, there's always divine providence. Our Lord has intervened. Our Lord has used uh, uh, his saints to intervene, whether it's Spain or the most recent or the most popular, let's say, Fatima. Fatima is a divine providence intervention, believe it or not. Um, so we're not completely abandoned. And this is a great chance for us in America to cling to the faith. Uh, and what a great opportunity we have right now. Absolutely. Yeah, This is, and this is so relevant for us to think about the things that we're going to be talking about. Um, in particular, we have we have Joe Biden and we have very a uh, number of other Catholics who are essentially uh, we would consider them traitors to the faith in a way, mm -hmm. uh, whether they're couple or not. That's up to God to decide. But we we would pray that they would be converted before they face judgment, of course. Uh, but in this episode, when we talk about the 17th century, we're going to talk about another betrayal, not only from the pope, but from the neighboring nation, France. <laughs> and the French are going to have a very big role to play yeah. in this century as, unfortunately, traitors to the faith in, in a very strong way. Now, if you are very, you if you are uh, up in arms about the French during this episode, stay tuned because on Friday we're going to have another French episode, which is going to be uh, Catholic France in North America. And this is going to be the good side of France. Th that'll be with Charles Colomb. It'll be a great episode. We're really excited for that because... Uh, Kennedy and I did that, and he's a um, French-speaking Anglo-Canadian. So we had a good time with that. that that's going to be the other side of the, the good side of France during this time. But this uh, this episode, we will cover the dark side of France during this century. Um, so, Luis, we have covered a lot of geography so yeah. far in our first two parts. Here's the Spanish and Portuguese Empire. At the, in the year 1600, now you have the Iberian Union. So Portugal and Spain are one kingdom. Yeah. So all of these territories, the green is, is Portugal and the blue is Spain. But in the year 1600, they're all one kingdom. Yeah. And as you can see, viewers, this is most of North and South America. And you also have the Philippines, various other sites in Africa, the Canary Islands. So before we get into the dark side and the difficulties of this century, what are the ways that Catholic civilization is growing during this century? We've talked about the Indians. We've talked about the Africans. We've talked about the different, uh, the mestizo race that's, that's coming. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the, the growth in Catholic civilization in all these areas. Well, it was an incredible explosion of growth and it was all driven by faith as as I said before, and by the way, a quick disclaimer, um, I'll go easy on the French since I obviously have a lot of admiration for Mr. Dr. Cologne. I watch his show with Vincent Franchini um, often, I mean, pretty much almost every week. And I've also had relatives uh, who lived in Montreal. So <laughs> I also have to wear, you know, wear a seatbelt when I talk about the French. But anyway, we'll, we'll be truthful as well. So uh, life... In uh, America, or as the Spanish called it, the Indias, you know, I mean, because it was not such thing as America, it was the Indias. Um, it was uh, flowing, growing. It was you know, incredible. Obviously, it wasn't perfect because there's not such thing as paradise, but it was great. It was one of those weird periods of history where peace finally starts settling. Um, seminaries were being built, academic institutions, uh, the role of women, as a matter of fact, even though it was already present in the Spanish one. I'm not talking about European. That's a different story. But at least from the Spanish perspective, 
the role of women was already a, had a primary role, you know, very relevant. We'll talk a, a little bit about the, the succession, you know, how the, the Salic law and all that a little bit later. Um, so in uh, New Spain or the New World, they're already having like colleges uh, for women, schools for like little girls uh, and all that. Nunneries were bringing up the Franciscans, as a matter of fact, were making huge success in converting the Indians. There's a great um, story in Texas. I don't know if you're familiar with this. Uh, Our Lady uh, Blue, which is with Maria de Agreda, um, which when the Spanish finally settled you know, from Florida, they started exploring the Franciscans were with the conquistadors. When they entered Texas, they uh, encounter a tribe of Indians named the Cano tribe, which is far west Texas, eastern New Mexico area. You know, there were nomads. Um, and they, about 3,000 of those Indians, uh, surrounded this little posse of Spanish explorers. Well, they were freaked out because they're like, okay, we're going to die or something. Well, the Indians said, hey, we want you to tell us about your God, Christ. What do you mean, Christ? There's no European that has ever made it all this, you know, this far. Um, who told you? Well, there's this lady in blue who was telling us, has been telling us about Christ, has visited us often, you know, the last 10 years. And she just made her last visit and told us that when we see holy men carrying a cross to go and approach. So eventually, long story short, they put th- two things together. And it turns out that all the way back in Spain, uh, Maria de Agreda, uh, had like by locations, you know, episodes. And she was describing literally the flora and fauna, like, you know, the, the landscape down to the streams and rivers, rocks and cacti, like all these things that were not in Europe. It's like, I, I saw this place, I spoke Spanish, but, the, you know, this tribe spoke to them in their tongue, blah, blah, blah. And they put two things together after a thorough investigation. It turns out that she was doing some by location evangelizing. And when the Indians approached the Spaniards, about 9,000 Indians eventually were baptized and, and converted uh, all this. So this is what's happening. Our Lady, in other words, is very active in the New World, helping Spain to carry out its mission and uh, doing civilization. Otherwise, Timothy, there's no way uh, this mission could have been carried out. What I mean, otherwise you'll have to suppress it. You know, you have to use force. So that's the difference between Spain, France, England, Portugal, you name it, uh, is Spain was aided by Our Lady, you know, God provided, in other words, so the Spanish just basically had to follow suit, whereas the other ones had to force a lot more than, than the Spanish had to do. That's excellent. Yeah, I love that story. Um, an amazing story. I, I wanted to point out the the territory here that's being covered. This goes all the way up to Alaska, Alaska really, yeah. and this is going to be a an important point when we get to the history of the United States. So Mm -hmm. remember how much territory right now is, is part of Spain at this point. So this is already new Spain at this point. Um, What, what other saints are working during this time? Um, The Jesuits are in full swing as well. And then you also have a great explosion of art. Uh, You have, Poets and lawyers, like uh, and uh, intellectuals, like Garcilaso, which is a mixed race, you know, it's a mestizo, uh, white mixed with indigenous, uh, going on here. You have uh, nobility from uh, the old, the new world, whether it's Incan or Aztec, already settling in the Spanish courts, which she was on her, you know, in that time period. And let me make a little parenthesis here, a little uh, quick pit stop. Usually, when empires conquer, they obliterate their enemies. They, they, they basically, we want, you lost, deal with it, you're gone. You know, they don't even allow them to be part of them. If at best, at best, they can aspire to be slaves or sort of some sort of uh, indebted servitude, you know, perpetual. If not, this plot flat all disappear. Well, Spain didn't really approach that. Um, you know, they didn't put matters that way. They said, okay, we got to, we want, but you are now my brother. You're going to be a Spanish brother. You're going to speak Spanish, but you have the same rights as I do. And you're going to have the same obligations. You're going to carry the same faith as I carry. And you will be entitled to the same laws. Keep in mind, in our last episode, we mentioned that law, that Roman law concept was brought by Spain to the new world. Because prior to that, Timothy, 
in uh, Mesoamerica, like the indigenous tribes, you know, the supposed tribes uh, that they, we're trying to revive that lifestyle, uh, the law was whoever carried the biggest stick, he was the lawmaker. You know, that's end of the story. You know, the big tribe boss said so, and whether he's right or wrong, you you either comply or your head will be chopped off or whatever, you know. Well, that ain't happened with uh, a Greco-Roman thought. You know, you had rights. We see it we in, in, in the... Um, in the Babel narrative with St. Paul, when they were going to uh, kill them, and he said, well, is this the way you treat a uh, Roman citizen? You know, that, that whole concept comes all the way from back then. So Spain is giving uh, laws, creating a civilization. Things are going actually really well. You know, uh, there is a full chain of commerce going between the Canary Islands to the New World, to the Philippines, to Taiwan, back forth to, you know, the New World, back to the Canary Islands, back to Spain, and all the way up to the uh, lower countries. So let's t talk a few about a little bit about some criticisms of New Spain at this point before we get into the Thirty Years' War. And one of the criticisms is the well, we've mentioned the black slavery, but one question is what are the what are the black slaves doing in New Spain? I, I believe they're just in the really the Caribbean area, right? Is that the main place where the Africans are enslaved? And this brings a great point because. The, the concept of slavery, first of all, you know this, it was settled back in even the Middle Ages before that a Christian could not own a Christian, um, even if you were French or whatever. That was just the deal. So there is a two approach of system. The, um, the Spanish approach was we conquer, reconquer our land. Slavery was very predominant among the Moors. Let, let us clarify that. But because Spain had a more of a subsidiary system, right? Um, meaning it cannot tolerate some things so, um, without like, oppressing them all the way because they don't want to create insurrections and all that. Uh, Spain designed a system that will basically shed um, uh, ra uh, racism, um, slavery. That's my point. It will create the conditions to eliminate that. Let me give you an example. Well, um, with uh, the Jews. There were a lot of Jews in Spain throughout history, and they were always able to hang out and all that. But by the second or third generation, uh, they will end up converting to Christianity. Uh, St. Teresa of Avila actually had Jewish ascendants, you know, heritage. Uh, there's a lot of them that they had and end up being, uh, we, the term was new Christians, meaning that they were converts, recent converts per se. That was not an issue. Think of it like in America nowadays. You know, I'm a first generation Hispanic. Uh, my children are, you know, American born and raised and all that. Basically, my grandkids or my great grandkids, if I'm lucky and blessed enough to have those, will not likely be uh, very fluent in Spanish because that's the way that America absorbs, you know, culturally speaking, all these generations. It retains some of the great traditions like Posadas and Catholicism and all that. But really, they become full-fledged Americans by the second generation, if not later. Sooner or later will happen. That was kind of the same was going on with the Spain, but in the Catholic perspective. So they just created the conditions for their subsequent generations to become Catholic or Christian. And one of those institutions that survived for a while was slavery. It was mainly among the Moors. But there's a trick. Um, there is a ticket out of slavery, and that was professing the Christian faith. If you were baptized... That was your bail card. You, know, card. you no longer were a slave because you, again, cannot own a slave. A lot of that tone about slavery and all that was said by uh, Isabella, Queen Isabella of Castile. Uh, I always go back to her, but there's a reason why. That really set the conversation in a different round. I said, okay, she literally will call the uh, indigenous people my children i mean she loved uh the indigenous people to the point that she adopted them as her own and that really used uh, uh set the tone for spain to kind of um decide well, okay we're gonna go this way on the other side like let's use the the portuguese the portuguese for multiple reasons they actually went a little more the slavery route uh, because they, that enabled them to gain some uh, mercantile progress, like a lot of money and independence, independence from Spain, to be honest, uh, from early on. And slavery was a trade that, you know, made a lot of money. Again, the core of slavery was among the Muslim world. But the Portuguese made quite a bit of money, obviously the English and the French. 
And that's a way for Portugal, or that was a way for Portugal to isolate themselves, to protect themselves. And this is why you see a lot of the uh, black descendant population in places like Brazil, which is Portuguese, and some of those areas, and even in America, to be honest. Whereas in the true Hispanic lands, as you see in the blue in the map, we don't have a big percentage of black descent populations because and if, if, in other words, if you bring an African person, slavery had to be involved in the process. Well, the Spanish crown was very deliberate to, to make sure that there was not, it was not a thriving industry. And this is why you see more mestizos than mulattos, you know, which is the mix between uh, black and white uh, in the new world. Yeah, one of the black legends is is the colonial transatlantic slave trade, which was essentially Christians falling for the temptation of the Mohammedans. I mean, the Mohammedans had been doing a thriving slave trade for how many centuries at the at by thir- fourteen hundred, and this was and all the also the Vikings in the north, and this would basic the slave trade had basically slowly been abolished by the Christian Church, and then these rich Christian kings, whether they were in Spain or England or whoever, they did fall to the temptation that had already been going on. So the the church abolished slavery gradually, and then they had to abolish it again later, essentially. Yeah. Um, so it, but what I see as the big difference is that the Catholic powers are abolishing slavery. They're basically con- creating the conditions where slavery is abolished sort of automatically over time, yeah. which is basically less bloodshed. Well, let, let me give you an example. There is a uh, former slave, a mix between a Spanish and Moor slave, uh, who was an assistant of Diego Velázquez, that great painter, uh, Juan de Pareja. Uh, that's his name, or uh, John, I guess, uh, in English will be. And he was a painter as well. There's a portrait of him in the museum in New York City. Um, they, and, and that's one of the great testimonies that he was freed. He was a Christian. And he didn't come from, like, let's put it like a royal stock or an old Christian stock. I mean, it was, once again, your ticket out of that world uh, was profession of Christian faith. Charles Coulomb, since you mentioned him earlier, you're going to have him on, on Friday. Charles Coulomb mentions a great story of comparison. And I, I mean, that stuck in my mind uh, long ago when I heard him in his show. And he brings the, the comparison distinction that between including France, the, the Catholic perspective of slavery versus the uh, uh, Protestant one or the Anglo, if you want to call it that way. Oh, well, it was center of this. If uh, from France, he, he speaks from the French perspective. If somebody had a child with a slave, like from the France, uh, French colonies, that child will be automatically a free uh, person. And not just that, he was endowed or she was endowed to a Christian, a Catholic education to be more specific. So it was not like, okay, I had a, a uh, child, but I'm not going to care for him. It's like Catholic law bound that Frenchman to uh, care after that, child, that, that child. And that child was immediately free on top of that. Whereas, and he mentioned, this is a very somber reality. Because uh, when he said it really made my heart sunk in the uh, American colony side, if that were happen, when that did happen, actually, to be more specific, that child had um, increased its value so they could sell it for a higher profit because it was considered a hybrid. Um, I'm not trying to bring judgment or on our ancestors different times. I'm not making an excuse either. But that kind of helped us to get a little concept uh, of what the world was like, how the visions collided, the Catholic vision, even among the French, which we're at odds often. Uh, was radically different than uh, the non-Catholic nations. Um, in my opinion, we still live in some of those consequences, you know, from that line of thought to this day in America. Yes, absolutely. There's um, the strong economic forces really are going to come to a head in the 1700s, which we'll talk about the second great papal betrayal, because very much the economics of this all, all of the the economics. It, the, the the tension that we're describing that's even happening in Spain. Be, I mean, be, because basically these slavers, they want, they're incentivized to suppress the gospel because if the gospel spreads, they lose their slaves. Yeah. And then on the other hand, the Jesuits and the other orders are trying to spread the gospel, which is against the economic interests 
of the the slavers and the the other elites who are just trying to make money and and you know just abuse the natives whether they're wherever they are exactly so you're having these sort of a certain amount of civil war uh within these different catholic powers and it seems like the civil war is the least at least of much of a problem in Spain. In Spain, it's the most harmonious as much as possible, whereas it was happening more in Portugal and France, and most of all in England, where they didn't have the sacramental understanding. And their economic yeah. system, as you said, was incentivizing them to basically have illegitimate children and create these shadow families and these these just yeah. destroying the, the African families completely with this, yeah. with this economic system. And it was crazy to me, if I may add very quickly, from a Catholic perspective, it was acknowledged that um, life happens, you know, even in France or whatever, Portugal, whatever, life happens. And there, the church had a system, uh, a network of orphanages uh, in social assistance from a church perspective for that child not to be abandoned, you know, whether it's physically or and spiritually, not just physically. The, the the church didn't condone those things. Let's just be clear about it. But they understood that things happen and we're in a fallen world and people have, um, people sin, we all sin. And they, they kind of got ahead of the curve saying, okay, if this is going to happen, how do we mitigate that effect and, and bring something good out of something, you know, that shouldn't have happened? And for whatever reason, Timothy, that's the way sin operates, not to divert any uh, theological discussion. But as you mentioned, it was a very profitable industry, uh, slavery, human um, demeanor. When you strip human dignity, for whatever reason, uh, beyond my understanding, it just brings a lot of profit in this world. It condemns your soul. But we see it nowadays also in America with infanticide, You know, not to get into that controversy as well, but we have legalized infanticide. And what where children are being killed in the womb, that makes profit sadly, and this is what we're trying to fight as Christians. And, you know, it goes beyond Catholic, to be honest. Uh, it's an aberration, but it's the same story now as it was back then. And if the church is trying to fight it, well, back then we're trying to fight it nowadays. Yeah, I think so. I think this is brings us to the big difference between the Catholic and Protestant powers. After 1517, the Luther, Luther's Reformation, it creates a situation where it is uh, Christian kings are incentivized to become heretics so that they can have sexual freedom and they can steal church property and get rich. So there's a strong push towards money and so-called sexual re liber liberation that's happening in uh, England, in uh, the Netherlands. Yeah. Meanwhile, as we've discussed, the Spanish Empire is continuing the greatness of Christendom with the Baroque civilization, which we've discussed. You mentioned Diego Velasquez. We, I've been putting up his painting at the end with our, with our, our father. So his painting, one of my favorite crucifixion paintings. But there's always this competition between the, the heretical kingdoms are trying to somehow justify in their minds that they're actually a better civilization. But... What's really interesting is they cannot make beauty like Spain can. They can't make the same greatness of beauty because they're they're just focusing on money. And what we're going to see as we continue on is that they are able to gain power through science and money. And yeah. that ends up being their idols. And usury, to be, to be more specific, yes. that's actually like through, you know, usurious banking ways. Because in the Catholic perspective, we have... We had banking as well, obviously, but there was not such thing as usury was always frowned upon. Um, that that was it's a sin. Uh, you know, ironically, so as the way we make money, at least big money in our Western society. But that was kind of like the ticket out of poverty, and they gained they they did gain a lot of power. They became the the rules of the world and the inheritors of the Western civilization, if you want to put it that way. But at what price? You know, you spread usury and spread, um, you know, the erosion of the family values um, that we are living literally in our days. Um, that's the situation we're in. Um, very quickly regarding the, uh, the, the slavery situation, it was finally abolished. And let me just clarify something. 
that well, all that I said does not mean or equal, equate that the Spanish kings were not uh, morally, you know, pure. I mean, there were some of them very, very immoral, very. Um, what's the word I'm trying to find? I'm trying to do a family friendly word, but there was just not behaving in a very faithful way. Let's put it that way. Um, so that's the reality. Too. It's just a human condition, not to justify it. We, we acknowledge it, but even that was the, what's going on. The church had made provisions to address those situations, just like you have penance, I guess nowadays. Yeah. So basically this is um, reading from uh, Henry Sears, Phoenix from the ashes. Um, he, he mentions on page 70 that by the early 17th century, so, so Spain has gained this ascendancy, conquered all this land, uh, we're converting back all these Protestant areas, St. Francis de Sales is taking back Geneva for Christ, all these areas, and he mentions by the early 17th century, there were only two places in Europe, Holland and Sweden, where militant Protestantism was still on the advance. And in both these, its strength was relatively a recent growth. So you see that what's interesting is that in into 60, early 1600s, mm -hmm. the Catholics are taking back Europe for the faith. Yeah. The, they're, the, it's one of the most remarkable turn uh, counterattacks, basically. Yeah. Uh, for the you have the ma most massive uh, destruction of of everything by the Protestants, and the Catholics regroup. They beat back the Mohammedans, the Council of Trent. Spain is the central player in all of this. And Spain is leading the, the Christendom and, and taking back Europe for the faith. And not only that, but as you can see, the whole world. So tell us about what happens with France and the great papal betrayal. How does this change? Well, um, let me preface this also. When you're talking about the late uh, 1600s, early 1700s, there was also a plague uh, that killed about half a million Spaniards, um, the, which is a lot. Of Spain at its height of population had about 8 million people, which is, uh, to put it in context, Dallas, Fort Worth, the, the city where I, uh, I live, it's about 7 million people once you count the whole metroplex. So imagine... That's a ton of people you lose through plagues. Uh, so you are dealing with wars, uh, powers competing, uh, popes not really being keen on you. Uh, you have Pope Clement uh, at that time in the, in the 1700s, right when the Bourbons come into power. Now, quick parenthesis, very quickly. Um, when we think of the animosity of the popes, I don't care which one you pick, with Spain, Here's where my dear um, uh, Francophiles, you know, my dear French-loving people, uh, don't take it too hard. But a lot of the uh, the problems we had originated with the French, you know, with the Avignon situation, kind of created a spirit in Italy, modern-day Italy, because technically Northern Italy was part of the Spanish uh, uh, monarchy, and also Southern Italy, as a matter of fact. But the, look, that center part of Italy, the Papal States. They kind of left a really bad taste on them, and maybe not officially, but in all terms of you know, practicality, they decided um, to keep the uh, papacy under Italian uh, rulership, like you know, lineage, in other words, because they were like, yeah, we're not going to do that again. Well, guess what? You have this new crown, this new empire ascendant, which is Spain. Well, the popes were obviously highly suspicious. They already had the memory of the French situation. Um, and, and, you know, the rest is history. More than the papal betrayals, if you, um, is my personal opinion, I really see the ideas of the Enlightenment uh, affecting Spain more than that. Because usually what people tell you is, well, the Bourbons came because, you know, Charles II uh, could not have any children. So he picked the uh, grand nephew of King Louis XIV of France, you know, the son king. And, you know, once the French came over, everything went down the drain. Well, it's a little more complex than that. Um, but let's, first of all, let's contrast. Why would the French, you know, run down Spain? You know, what's the difference between those two monarchies? Well, the French had a little more of an absolute monarchy where whatever the king says, you know, it goes. Kind of like that big stick rule. Whereas uh, the Hispanic monarchy was a little different. It was influenced by Castile 
once again, the land of uh, Queen Isabella. And it, 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 the king had a little more uh, restrained powers. It was a, lot, a more subsidiary. The social mobility under the Hispanic monarchy, for example, was merit-based. So if you, for example, were uh, just a commoner and, and you had no nobility, no titles, nothing, to move up the ladder, you have to kind of prove yourself, whether it's I went and conquered lands for the church, you know, the new world, the Philippines, whatever it is, or I'm a pretty smart guy, you know, and, and the church kind of scouted you and saw, hey, this guy has skill and talent. He's going to be a great scholar or a great priest or whatever. You know, um, Something had to be proven that you were worthy of uh, uh, going up the ranks. And also the court had a lot of power in the Hispanic monarchy. The French is a whole different story. You know, um, they were not as Romanized, to put it that way. So they had a little more of a centralized monarchy. Uh, it was more bureaucratic. As a matter of fact, when the Bourbons came uh, to Spain, there was a lot of one of the big reforms was they changed the, the councils. Every city had to kind of get, retain a lot of their traditions and, and ways and means as long as they were faithful to the church and the crown and they were, you know, paying their duties to the church and the crown, uh, everything kind of mostly were left alone. Well, the French well, with the Bourbons um, basically said, we're going to reform that. And this is the birth of the, uh, six, like the secretary, the concept of the secretary, like we have the, you know, the secretary of state, secretary of treasury, whatever it is that really came from the French, you know, in Spain, which turned into a, uh, a community organization, like a council, turn it into a bureaucratic apparatus. We, we can thank the French for that one. So the, so you're talking about Louis the Fourteenth, and with Versailles is the one who sort of creates modern bureaucracy, mm -hmm. where he takes all of the local lords who are supposed to be in their local villages taking mm -hmm. care of business, yeah. and he brings them all to Versailles and says, "Hey, have a cake." Or whatever they do in Versailles, they're not doing their duty for their people, but they're just living in luxury. Yeah. So when does the? Can you tell us about the Bourbon uh, switch in Spain? What? Because we've been talking about the Habsburg family and the Habsburg dynasty. Yeah. When does this happen? Where the French spirit of this sort of secular spirit, sort of uh, absolutist spirit, uh, sort of just glorying in the name of France and not in the name of Jesus Christ. When does that begin to come into Spain? That came in the 1700s, literally November 1700. Um, to give us a little context, you have Charles I, emperor uh, of Christendom. Um, and then you have Philip II, the guy who built the Escarol, the, uh, the guy who really Back actually... in 1500s, just yeah. so you know. Yeah. Yeah. For everybody. We're, you know, his son. Then he has, obviously, a son, Philip III. But... Philip II, his father, regretted that he knew that his son was not very capable. He literally said, like, you know, God has granted me a son to rule, but not the ability or for him to rule, actually. He was more, like, careless and, you know, want to, you know, mess around with women and all those kind of things and the love bulls fighting, all this, like, uh, and delegated a lot of his, the, the administration of the kingdom to either church, you know, cardinals or whoever, you know, prelates or whatever. And then he had another son, uh, Philip III, had a Philip IV on the 1600s. This is after the, the Thirty Years' War. And he was definitely more capable uh, administering the kingdom, but his moral character was not necessarily also very good. Uh, and also the gene pool was very limited. So then after that came Charles II. You know, the guy we see in paintings with uh, congenital diseases and uh, deformations and all that. Well, he he could not have children, obviously. And that's when the question is, like, how do, where did the bourbons come in? Well, uh, Charles II, you know, his sister was married to Louis XIV. So he's related to, there's a continuation. This is one of the greatest myths that we take from the Spanish uh, line of succession it really all the way from Palayo to uh, this day, there's been a continuation because they're all really related in some way or another. There's an alliance. It's not like a complete foreign intervention from the French. So this uh, Philip of Anjou uh, comes to Spain uh, rather than uh, the alternative, which is uh, Charles from Hasburg. Um, 
So the that he is from the Bourbon uh, branch. Philip of Anjou becomes the king of Spain, and now the the Bourbons are in Spain. And this actually creates some trouble because you have all these other European powers, namely England, Austria, which didn't get their guy, in, you know, into the line of succession, really upset and bothered because you have France with a lot of extension territories and conquered, you know, like that land, plus Spain. That's a big combo there. I mean, and they're like, we got to intervene. So the Protestants and all the other powers, even Catholic powers, started to intervene. That includes some papal intervention as well, because, again, they had a really bad taste from the uh, Avignon you know, episode a few centuries back. And this is how we get into the whole mess of the Bourbons. Once the Bourbons come in, they bring the bureaucracy and also this concept of the Salic laws. I don't know if you're familiar with it or not, which is, but for those of you who are not very familiar, uh, the Salic laws is uh, the old tradition from, again, the area of France and Netherlands and all that, where succession has to be through, passed through male. That was completely foreign in the Hispanic kingdom. I mean, one of the greatest examples is Queen Isabella. It's not the only one, but that's, again, uh, the evidence doesn't back that up. Well, the, the, that custom, for whatever reason, remained in the French you know, aristocracy and culture. Once the Bourbons made it to Spain, guess what? They brought a little bit of that concept. But by the end of the century, it was also kicked out, little derogated, which led to another episode, which we'll later talk in a different episode to the Carlist Wars. That's a different topic for a different episode again. Um, but anyway, anyway, back to the whole concept. So French uh, intervention in Spanish life kind of modified a little bit of the way we see uh, um, the monarchy in, in a certain way. So when and now when did the plague happen? Was that later during the that bourbon uh, uh, in the, the year seventeen hundred? Um, no, late fifteen hundred, so there's sixteen hundreds. Okay. That's when the plague was. So the you know the kingdom had to fight that as well. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. So the so the seventeen hundreds or the seventeenth century rather the sixteen hundreds yeah. starts off with the plague hitting uh, Spain, yeah. and then and then we have the. 30 years war, which I want to get back to in a second, but there's also right after the Bourbons come in, is it Madrid that burns? I can't remember because they re, re they rebuild the palace according yeah. to Versailles, right? Yeah. And again, it's this whole restarting. But the Bourbons also did a lot of great things. They expanded the faith. Uh, there was obviously, again, uh, frictions because you, you have a French branch, you know, dealing with the papacy. The papacy is not very... You know, keen on the French again you know, for whatever reason and all that, uh, but things are going sort of well. the The finances are being restored, but one of the main pitfalls here is when the ideas of the Enlightenment, which again come out of France, um, started infiltrating the Spanish life. and And this is, in my opinion, this is a debatable opinion, but this is my opinion when the real fall of Spain started to happen. It's not so much for what the enemies did, and not even England. Uh, this is where I break ranks with a lot of the Hispanic historians and you know experts and all that because a lot of them associate blame to the english and And in reality, we think about it. England was never really, really that powerful. It was really French, France that enabled England to do, you know, all these great things. But England was mainly concerned about preserving their identity and their business was piracy. I mean, that's who they were. And when you have that kind of, you know, system, you can't really grow a whole lot. Uh, compared. They're not really interested in building civilizations, in other words. So the legacy is not there. Um, they conquer. They conquer quite a bit of land. But they really never really set civilizations in other places other than America, like the five eyes, New Zealand, America, Australia. And it came out a very, very hefty price, a lot of bloodshed, uh, sadly. But really, they went further than that. I mean, India, Pakistan, you know, all these other places. Um, whereas the Spanish were trying to build a civilization. That takes a lot more effort. But really, the French were very jealous of the Spanish success. They were jealous that they reached their height with uh, Charlemagne. You know, they had an emperor. Now Spain has an emperor with Charles V or Charles I, I'm sorry. Um, and they're carrying the flame of Christ, to put it that way. France is not. So France has to catch up with it. And that's how France was really, um, it's, it's coveting, if you ask me, um, what was trying to pitfall. 
uh, the Spanish ascendants and they didn't realize, but with those actions, Timothy, they brought down a lot of the Christendom. Yeah. Well, I'm going to, I want to ask you about the consecration of Spain to the sacred heart, because that's a big thing in, in France as well. But before we do that, I wanted to just mention what happens in the 30 years war <clears throat> is essentially that the, the wars of religion, as we, we, as we mentioned earlier, so the Christendom is fighting back against Protestantism by 1600 Protestantism is in decline and war breaks out where Protestants are trying to, to now counterattack the counterattack in the 30 years war. And this is one of the worst wars yet in Christendom because there's a lot of new technology that's used a lot of, a lot more total war where they're, you know, just burning villages and killing civilians and all that. Um, there is a more conscriptions happening out of the Swedes coming down. Uh, they're drafting. It's just more militarism. And in the center of it is Pope Urban VIII, who in 1630 encourages Richelieu, the cardinal minister of France, who is he's a cardinal really in name only because he's really just a bureaucrat trying to exalt France. And Urban VIII, as you said, at this time, they're they're worried about the Habsburg Spain and Urban VIII helps France side with the heretics against Spain during the Thirty Years' War, which is really the decisive moment that stops the Counter-Reformation advance and helps the ascendancy later of England and, and the Dutch uh, empires. And I wanted to mention this, The um, read this real little passage from Seer. He says, um, so in 1630, Urban VIII encouraged Richelieu to, to renew the Dutch alliance, again, these are heretics, and incited his sabotage of the Electoral College. Even in the winter of 1631, when Gustavus Adolphus, which is a Swedish heretic uh, rampaging through the Catholic bishoprics in Germany, Pope Urban would not stir to condemn the Swedish alliance. So we're, we're frustrated right now. Pope Francis is not condemning the Chinese or, or all these things. Well, you know, we had a massive war going on where the the, the counter-reformation was at stake and the Pope betrayed the very counter-reformation that had, had been uh, in the ascendancy. And, and this is um, what Sears says, the view in Rome was expressed by one who, one of them who appeared at this time and said in, in, at, at the uh, court in Rome is his holiness, the Pope by chance, a Catholic. This is the type of thing that people were aware of at the time with Pope Urban VIII. And this is what changes the, the, the whole trajectory of post-Reformation history, um, where Urban VIII, and then he also uh, takes a personal, uh, a personal attack of Galileo, and he's the one who condemns Galileo in that famous episode. As a, as a as Sears says, it's a personal vengeance against Galileo. Anyhow, but I want to just get that in. Yeah. Any comments on that before we get into the Sacred Heart? Uh, yeah, very quickly. Uh, there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, for, so for those Catholics, now they in our day and age, my fellow Catholics here in America who are like, oh, man, the world is falling apart. You know, we're having issues with the Holy Father and all these things. Well, guess what? That's what our ancestors did. You know, we're all fallen human beings. And uh, we just have to deal with it, you know, carry our cross and, you know, do our best. That being said, one of the reasons why that counter-reformation was very successful. It was because Loyola. Loyola uh, set up the path, put it that way, because he came from a military background, by the way. That's the difference between Loyola and a lot of people. Founder of the Jesuits. Founder of the Jesuits. Yeah, yeah, the founder of the Jesuits. Uh, he came from a military background, so all these spiritual disciplines had a military uh, flavor, to put it that way. Uh, and military was more concerned about being efficient, you know, uh, more than anything else. That's the whole point of military. You know, you go there, do your job and get out. Well, um, translate that plus the whole school of Salamanca, which we already discussed in previous episodes. It was the perfect combination. It was not infallible because there's nothing perfect other than God, but um, they work so well, the counter-reformation. You know, it's a great thing. Also, I forgot the date. Uh, right now it escapes me. but. There was the, forget the name of that Pope, that tried to suppress the Visigoth rite, or the Mozarabic rite, which is the same thing. Uh, it was the rite that when the Moors conquered the, 
the Spanish Peninsula, these Christians retain their right, just like you have a, a Maronite right or you have different rights in the Catholic Church. This the the Mosaic right or the Visigoth uh, Visigothic right, which is the same thing, uh, was kept and is still kept till this day. It is the only right, by the way, that the Church uh, allows to wear blue during uh, Advent. This is why any Spanish-speaking country, particularly Spain and Mexico, but any Spanish-speaking country, and even some dioceses here in the United States, uh, sometimes get away with wearing blue. Everybody else has to wear uh, purple. Uh, so anyway, but my point is this. I forgot the name of the Pope, but he tried to suppress it. And the church in Spain, the bishops and all that, protested saying, hey, we were able to keep our faith despite what the Moors did to us. How could it be? That you you're trying to do the damage to us that not even the Moors did to us. You know that's so to put it in perspective. Sometimes when we feel wronged and sometimes it's justified, uh, just rest assured that there, there's nothing new under the sun, and truth will always prevail. Absolutely. So tell us about the Sacred Heart of Jesus and Spain. Famously, the we've mentioned it. Me and Kennedy mentioned it a few weeks ago. I think the um, so Saint Mar Margaret Mary Alacoque is mm -hmm. the one who sends a message. So during all this controversy with France sort of betraying the faith, mm -hmm. St. Margaret Mary Alacoc sends a message to, I believe it was Leader the Fort, Louis the 14th. I could be, yeah. it could be 15th. I can't recall if it's 14 or 15th. Yeah. But he sent, she sends a message and asks him to consecrate France to the Sacred Heart, which he yeah. refuses to do. And then many see the French Revolution as a reprisal of basically the wrath of God coming down on France. For refusing to do that, and that's why Louis the Sixteenth consecrates Sacred Heart in his jail cell before he gets executed. So, what happens with Spain in the Sacred Heart? This is a lesser known story that I, I had never heard before. Tell us about that. Philip the Fourth, Philip I'm sorry, Philip the Fifth, the King, Bourbon King, brings that and it gets consecrated. Spain has actually twice consecrated to the Sacred Heart. One of the 1700s by Philip the Fifth in 1727. And then uh, in the early 1900s by King Alfonso of Spain, too. So, you know, they doubled down in true Spanish sense. You know, anything that had to do with religion, we're going to do it over the top. You know, is, that, for whatever no, is, is Philip V the first bourbon king yeah. of Spain? Who comes? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, that's a great, uh, great yeah. benefit. And this is why, like, you know, we're very careful not to condemn anything that is bourbon or whatever. You know, it's like, hey, you know, there are good things that happen, too. Obviously, uh, the price of something, but... Look what happened to France, uh, as we know the story of the French Revolution. People, I mean, when we see what the communists did in Russia, which our later Fatima warned us, by the way, uh, and people misinterpret that message of like, hey, there's not going to be enough, you know, Walmarts across the world. That's not the message of Fatima. It's like the heirs of Russia. But once you analyze those heirs of Russia, you look back into it like, oh, my goodness, this is what the French did. And by the way, it's, it's like the 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 uh, lavande, you know, slaughter in France. You know, it's just like the the atrocities that the French committed when the French Revolution happened. Uh, I mean, honestly, sometimes makes ISIS look like a cakewalk. I'm mean, I'm shocked to see how they killed and tortured. They will take no prisoners, things like that. I'm like, wow, you know, all because, um, as usual, it's a spiritual battle that takes a physical manifestation. Well, the alignment obviously discarded this whole thing. You know, they're all like, ah, whatever. You know, it's, it's just material world and all that stuff that we already know. They literally try to reinvent the calendar in the French Revolution, et cetera, et cetera. Well, in the Spanish sense, they were like, no, we're going to cling to it. It came with a price. Eventually, uh, Spain lost all their possessions uh, in the 18th century. They were uh, really suppressed and free, frank Freemasonry. Because remember, there are different Freemasonry rights, just like their rights in the church. You have the Scottish right, you have the York right, which is in the US. You have the French one. The French one is particularly toxic, all of them, but the French one is very, very toxic. Um, I recommend listening to uh, maybe Professor Barsena to talk about the Freemasonry more than you know anybody else. But anyway, uh, it, it was the branch that infected Spain and the rest is history. All right. So this is the the turning point in 1648 is when the Thirty Years' War ends, which is when there is many see this as the origin of modern nations in this this yes. year, which is where they really cut up yeah. these different areas. Before this, there was 
I mean, it's so strange for us to think about, but yeah. before this, there really wasn't nations. There was just sort of domains, but yeah. really it was all about your city, the city that you lived in and your local region. You spoke a local dialect yeah. and you may not speak the same dialect as 200 miles down the road, you know, and uh, this type of thing really gets starts to begins getting a lot more speed after 1688, because yeah. this whole papal betrayal and the, the shift in power helps uh, the Netherlands and England unite in yeah. one heretical kingdom, which begins to gain the ascendancy after 1688. And yeah. Spain begins to decline, at least in monetary, uh, in the monetary military power. I mean, that's the only type of decline we're talking about. Look, um, that's a great point that you make about the, the whole concept of the national, un, you know, concept and understanding can the Canary Islands? Let me give you an example. Okay, it was conquered by a Frenchman at the service of the Spanish crown. There's not such thing as like, oh, I'm French and I only work for the French crown or whatever. This is like because the common threat was Catholicism. That's one of the greatest damage that the um, uh, Protestant Revolution brought. It really separated us. It really made us uh, neighbors and strange. Not even neighbors. They made us strangers when we were cousins, and that's a great loss. Well. Uh, Betancourt, which was a French guy, was the guy who conquered Can the Canary Islands. Columbus, uh, a Genoese uh, sailor or Italian, working for the Portuguese crown first and then for the Spanish crown. Ma Magellan, and, you know, there's a countless examples that you have people from different nationalities working from uh, for different um, kings because the understanding was we're working under a Catholic monarch. That's what was lost, to be honest. And once, if you notice, you mentioned earlier about the, you know, the the taking over the monasteries, you know, in the German parts of uh, Europe, where Protestant uh, Protestantism really settled, you start seeing the ascendancy of uh, banks, and and this is one of the key differences. For example, our layout of cities in America, we have a uh, downtown, and we do business. We have our, you know, city council, and we have our financial district and medical district. Like all this business goes on here in the center, and everybody lives around that. Well, the uh, Spanish layout is a little different. It's you have the the cathedral. Let's say here in Fort Worth, we have St. Patrick's, for example. That's the core of the city, and you have a plaza. Then you have the the city council, you know, where the mayor is. Then all these things start spreading across. That's why uh, Spanish cities are not necessarily on a grid like you have in the United States or a lot of the Anglo descent cities. Uh, different concept, different views. So for us, in order to have a community, you have to have a church. Well, back then, I don't now. Sadly, everything's changing for the worse. But back then, is you have to have a church in the middle of the community. That's the heart of it. So obviously, if that's going to be the center. You're going to build a huge cathedral, Baroque, or even uh, Gothic, whatever you choose, uh, that still lasts, you know, till this day. And keep in mind the engineering-wise, too, they had to counter things like earthquakes. Because in a lot of the uh, parts of the uh, Spanish America, we have earthquakes. Uh, so there's a lot of innovation going on there. But anyway, that's a different story. Excellent. Yeah. So I want to get to a few questions. So CF Holing says... Uh, why did God prevent the Armada from crushing the Brits? Was there a failure on the part of this on the on Spain? And he, so he's talking about way back in the 1500s, which is when uh, Philip II was going to launch the Spanish Armada uh, in to invade Britain and basically take back the island for the faith. And this is an epic moment because essentially the weather is a big factor, which blows the Spanish Armada away and so it's a very difficult moment so what are your thoughts on luis, on oh, that, luis? Uh, first let me clarify something because i get this question a lot uh technically they came back later and they won but that let's just set that a lot aside that's not even relevant there is this concept in christian thought modern christian thought is that if i'm on god's side i'm gonna win and i'm gonna do well in other words it's like sort of like a karma thinking if i do x then god will reward me see sort of like a prosperity gospel which is an anathema just because you follow the lord or the lord's decrees does not guarantee you success because they, we're not of this world okay and that applies in the micro whether it's individually or the macro which is you know countries or kingdoms and all that things um and it's often associated 
I think honestly it has to do a lot more, more with the Protestant influence from America, like Americanism, that heresy of Americanism that kind of has infected um, all sorts of branches of Christendom, Christendom where we think, well, we must be doing God's work because we're doing well. That's not always, always the case. Uh, the Armada is one of the examples uh, in that episode that, that they're mentioning here. They lost that battle. It was a big loss, and they later get, got back to it and all of that. It was irrelevant by then. And they cost the uh, Spanish uh, Armada a lot of uh, resources, but they were able to retain their souls and their faith. Yeah, I think that's a very good um, point because the the church is afflicted by plagues, like we mentioned, and plagues are we need to we basically always need to think of a plague as the wrath of God for our sins, and yeah. whether that's we're we but um, what you the pointed out just the the spiritual aspect of it, looking at all of these things as crosses and accepting them for our sins that we deserve. Here's a uh, Thomas says, how many of the Spanish who came to the Americas were actually conversos? That's a great uh, question. A lot less than people think. Uh, we years back, I did some genetic studies and friends of mine have done. Um, the ones who came, came from uh, Sephardic Jews. There's two main branches. There's, there's many, and you probably know them better than I do. In Judaism, you have the Ashkenazis Jews, and then you have the uh, Sephardic Jews. Sephardic, I'm sorry, Sephardic Jews. Sephardic Jews are the ones who migrated to uh, modern day Spain way back then. I mean, that's like we're talking, you know, even from the time of Christ and if not before. And uh, those when Christendom spread, they converted a lot of them. A lot of them retained. Well, there is a small fraction that migrated to the new world. And a lot of them were Portuguese, too, by the way. And in the case of um, Mexico, per se, they settled in Monterey, my hometown, um, some of them. But they, uh, there were not as many as people thought. Um, I honestly thought I had some Jewish stock in me. And turns out that I was not just wrong, but dead wrong. Um, I'm basically just mixed between Spain and the New World. Um, and there's a very small percentage minority people who actually have that Sephardic Jew. One of the keys, it's not the only one, by the way, but one of the keys to figure out if you might, might have uh, some Sephardic Jew tra uh, trace or lineage is the last names were modified, for example, uh, like nature, Luna, Moon, you know, Lobo, Wolf, uh, Garza, which is the, um, I forget the name, Heron, and so on and so on. Just because what, you have one of those last names does not mean you're, you're Sephardic at all. It's just, it's likely to find more of those. But it was, I would say, less than 10%. I mean, not even that much. Okay. Here's, a, here's an interesting question. Um, it was about Spanish being horsemen. Um, yeah. Bruce City says the Spanish were the greatest horsemen on earth during the height of their empire. Yeah. Um, why is this not more widely known now? Because the Indians in the United States are often thought of as riding horseback. Now, didn't didn't the Spain bring the horses to the New World? Right? Okay. I so tell love, us, tell love us about this. The, why are we okay? Great. Well, we finished with horses. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, it's because uh, that that really horses. Keep think about it. This is before the industrial era. I mean, horses were the kind of the, the power behind it. A lot of those things, you know, they were beasts of work and also war machines and all that. Now we have tanks and drones and whatever we have, but back then we're horses and pool carriages and all that. Anyway, so the Spanish bring horses, and this is uh, why this is the question. Let me see. Why is there not much talk about it? Okay, let me put it this way: the height of horsemanship happen actually in New Spain, modern day Mexico, and it's exemplified in the charro. I don't know if you saw a charro, Timothy, before or not. It's it's not the equivalent of an American cowboy. Uh, the, cow, the cowboy is actually an, um, a descendant of the charro. So the, 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 the Texans learned the tricks from the charros, and then the cowboy was born out of it. Uh, but that's the crown of horsemanship. So let me make a little contrast. Those of you who are not in Texas or the West or even the South, which is more like a Western thing. You're all in the Midwest. Rodeos uh, is a competition where you show your skills, right? Horse riding, reining, uh, bull riding, all those things. Because they're ranch skills and you know, life in the ranch. So if a, a cow will go running wild, you have to bring it back. Um, it's a lot harder to bring a cow than a sheep. So obviously that requires different skills. 
Well, rodeos are a competition among cowboys to see who has the best skill. That really comes from Spain. It comes from the when they were settling here in the New World and creating these ranches, ranchos, these big extensions of land and they had cattle and all that. The Spanish brought horsemanship, horsemanship and the Indians picked up pretty good and the two merged. And uh, the chatter was born. Chatteria, which is the uh, competition like a rodeo, uh, is like the most sophisticated. It's really hard to be a charro. Um, it's not easy to be a cowboy, but it's, it's a lot easier being a cowboy than being a charro. And that's that's what represented. It's not just being efficient, in other words. It's uh, being efficient and looking good at it, like being beautiful you know, at it. So you have to dress well. You have to deal with class and you have to be efficient, all those things at the same time, while the cowboy is a little more utilitarian. You know, it's just get to the point. Plus, the cowboy was influenced by American thought or Anglo thought, which is cowboys compete among themselves, whereas in charrerias, with the charro tradition, the horsemanship, it's teams of charros together competing against another ranch, you know, per se. So it's just different thoughts. And when Spain was, uh, when Mexico or New Spain was separated from Spain, that horsemanship from Spain basically got forgotten, even though it's still there. And the Charo legacy remained. And this is why we think of horsemanship of Mexico and the United States and, and the gauchos in the South. And not Spain. Excellent. So there you have it. Spanish horses. horses. Excellent. Any final thoughts for us? Uh, this we we went we went in the 1700s here. Uh, we've covered really. Yeah. We didn't get all the way up to the the big second great papal betrayal regarding the Jesuits, but maybe next time. So, uh, any final thoughts? Um, the the really, I mean, this is not really the decline of Spain per se. It's essential because it's. I mean, it's that's really looking at it in sort of the Anglo false history because the Anglo false history says. Uh, decline of Spain means you you lacked monetary or political yeah. power, which those things are the least important things to Christ's kingdom because he who is the least is the greatest. So the, the Spanish saints continue, the conversions continue, souls continue to be saved. Span, Spain goes on. Yeah. Any final thoughts for us, Luis? Uh, very quickly, you bring that last point is, Timothy, one of my concerns is that America is losing its identity. Um, we might, we will be a power for the next 50 to 100 years, militarily speaking. But at what price? You know, because we only have focused on making money and not really being Catholic or being Christian, per se. And money does not save your identity. You know, um, and this is my fear. Not so much for you and me. We're old men or grown men. We know where we stand. But it's what what America is going to be left for our children and grandchildren. Uh, so when we think of prosperity, we, we got to think it from a different perspective. In the Hispanic culture, cultures retain really strongly. Even there is being, you know, it's beginning to erode. Um, so my final thought is let's cling to the faith because that's the only way we can safeguard our culture here in America. And that's my prayer. You know, that's the only way America, in my opinion, will survive. It's by clinging to the red religion, the old religion, which is the Catholic faith. Absolutely. Excellent. I wanted to get one. We had a one super chat from Victor Morales, who is asking you about the book Imperophobia y Leyenda Negra by Maria Elbiera. Are you heard of this? book any comments yeah. on this study it's a great book i highly recommend it she comes from a little more uh, secular perspective rather than religious uh, but anyway highly highly recommend it excellent and can you give us a translation for this uh title in spanish um uh empire phobic uh and the black legend oh okay so it's dealing with this this whole yeah. subject that we're trying to rectify in our own little way great yeah excellent all right well uh let's wrap up this offer and our father for the intentions that you just mentioned which are clinging to our faith as we deal with the Marxist takeover yeah. and whatever President Biden wants to throw at us and all of the other Catholics. I want to pray especially for the soul of Joe Biden, the soul of Nancy Pelosi and all the other Catholics. Robert. They, yeah, that they may be converted. We want to understand that they are enemies of the faith in a sense that they're heretics, but the way that we deal with enemies is we want to convert them exactly. with charity and we want them to be saved. So... Uh, let's offer up an Our Father for that that uh, intention. Uh, give me a second to add the. Okay, here we go. Nomine Patris et Fidi et Spiritus Sancti. 
Amen. Pater noster, qui es in cedis, sanctificetum nomen tuum, adveniet regnum tuum, fiat vaduntas tua, sicut in cielo et in terra. Pane nostrum quotidianum da nobis odiem, et dimiti nobis debita nostra, sicute nos dimitibus debitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentationem, se libera nos a malo. Amen. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ our God, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. Nomine Amen. Patris, et Fidi, Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Amen.